Oh, how my soul praises the Lord. How my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he took notice of his lowly servant girl, and from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one is holy, and he has done great things for me. He shows mercy from generation to generation to all who fear him. His mighty arm has done tremendous things. He has scattered the proud and haughty ones. He has brought down princes from their thrones and exalted the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away with empty hands. He has helped his servant Israel and remembered to be merciful. For he made this promise to our ancestors, to Abraham and his children forever. To begin our time this morning, I want to give a quick uh, personal update. Uh, you may have heard over the past year me preach occasionally and bring up my three foster children and that my wife and I have been trying to adopt them for uh, over three, almost four years now. And I just wanted to let everyone know um, you have been a great support to us over this past year, especially uh, in as of uh, about a week and a half ago, we adopted them and it is done. <laughs> Thank you so much to all of you. The support and love you've shown to my family, it's meant the world to us. So thank you. Thank you very much. Now, something you may not know about me is that several years ago, I was a high school soccer coach uh, here in Indiana, actually. And there was this one year that really stood out to me uh, when I reflect on that. One year really was special because we had an amazing defensive team this one year. Uh, and I was a defensive player, and so defense uh, is more important than offense. And so <laughs> it meant a lot to me to have that year. Now, as a coach, we work to, you know, establish scheme and formation to be able to get strategy. And the players, they're working together to perform and to be able to work with one another out on the pitch. But both players and coaches work together to be able to create culture and motivation and really be able to have any level of success. You have to have both parties working together. And the best coaches invite their players into the planning process. They give ownership to the players. Steve Kerr, whether you like him or not, is the coach for um, the Golden State Warriors, and he's a winner. I mean, he's won as a player, he's won as a coach, and he said the players have to take ownership of it. As coaches, our job is to nudge them in the right direction and to guide them. That year, we had such an amazing defensive team, and we had two amazing leaders, especially at center back and goalkeeper, and they really took ownership. And they kept wanting more responsibility, and so as coaches, we just kept giving it to them. And that year, the way it turned out was a lot of all-conference uh, performances. We had players go to the all-conference games. We had a sectional title, um, and we had one of just the most fun years um, for the team and, and for us coaches. It, it was an amazing experience. The faith and the trust and the commitment between coaches and players made that happen. Now, something similar can happen between us and God every single day. As a coach, I had the authority to really do whatever I wanted. I could put certain players in certain positions. I could uh, put in the scheme that I wanted, whether I had the players to fit it or not. I could bench whoever I wanted. I could, I could do whatever. But I invited my players in to be a part of the process. I invited my players in to take ownership of what I wanted to do, and then together we made it happen. God has the authority to do whatever he wants, whenever he wants, however he wants, but God invites us in to be a part of it. He gives us ownership in his plan for his people and for this world. Now, humanity has always traveled far from God. We've always pushed away and rejected him constantly. We see this throughout history. God's plan has always been to make 
of relationship with him as easy and merciful as possible, while still making atonement for all the evil that we do in this world. So what did God do? God entered into human history as the man Jesus Christ. Fully human, fully God. And he died a terrible death to fulfill the just consequence for humanity's evil and bridge the relational gap that exists between us. And for that to happen, God continually invited individuals in to his plan. And we see this throughout scripture. And his plan to redeem this world continues today, and he still invites us in to be a part of that plan. It is amazing to see how God can look at us see our imperfection and still invite us in, want us to be a part of what he's doing. Because even as we're imperfect, God looks at our imperfect faithfulness and he doesn't scoff, he doesn't push us away, he celebrates it. He celebrates us and he honors us and brings us in and gives us ownership. And we see that over and over again, the convergence of God's faithfulness with our own faithfulness results in some amazing, spectacular, magnificent outcomes. One of the best examples that we find within Scripture of this convergence of faithfulness is Mary, the mother of Jesus. Mary loved God and faithfully served him best she could. And because of her faithfulness, She bore the Son of God. God invited Mary into his plan, and something amazing happened. We ought to honor her for the role that God gave her and look at her as an example and an inspiration for our own lives. Today, we're going to be looking at her song of praise within Luke 1. This whole series, our Christmas playlist, looks at the poetic expressions of worship found around the birth of Jesus throughout Luke 1 and 2. Mary glorifies God in an amazing song of praise. And in this song, we see that it is Mary's response to God telling her that she is going to be the mother of Jesus. And it's all of her emotion that had to do with that. We also see it's a response to her having a conversation with Elizabeth, a close relative, also the mother of John the Baptist, and a response to Elizabeth in this conversation, recognizing that the child that Mary has within her is the Messiah, the one that has been waited for. That's what this song is coming out of, this situation. And today we're going to see how Mary's faithfulness manifests in her worship and how we might find inspiration within it. So turn to Luke chapter 1 with me. We're going to start in verse 46 and go through 55. This is her whole song of praise. The first couple of verses, I'm going to be in the ESV, but then I'll switch back to the NLT, which is what are in the, uh, in the chairs in front of you if you're using one of those. So Luke chapter 1, starting in verse 46, says, And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. And so what we see here in these first couple of verses is that a faithful heart, Mary's faithful heart, a faithful heart joyfully magnifies the Lord. We see a few things about Mary throughout this entire song. The first thing we can notice is that Mary knows God's word. This song itself is actually modeled after a song of praise, a prayer that's made in 1 Samuel chapter 2. It is Hannah who will have Samuel, but she was barren. She couldn't have any children, and God blessed her with kids. And so she devotes her firstborn Samuel to God, and Hannah prays this this wonderful prayer of worship to God. And Mary models her prayer after Hannah's in scripture. And on top of that, we see about 12 other allusions or direct quotes of other scripture throughout this entire song of praise. 
Mary knows the Word of God because Mary loves God. Mary wants to have God be every part of her life. She, at a young age, has internalized the Word of God to such an extent that in a moment of emotion, she is able to quote Scripture and actually make it her own. And we find that Scripture and her love of God becomes a motivating factor in her own worship. In our own worship, if we know the Word of God, it should motivate and change the way that we worship. Because Mary shows that. Mary knows God's Word because she loves God, and she recognizes that she has a need for a Savior. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Mary knows that she needs God more than anything. That's why she knows God's Word. That's why she's memorized and internalized it, is because she needs God in her life. She knows that she needs a Savior, and she knows that no matter what her role is in God's plan, it is Him who deserves praise, not her. It is God who deserves praise. A faithful heart knows who God is and what He has to say to us. A faithful heart knows that we need Him more than anything, and a faithful heart knows that no matter what we do, God is to be magnified. Not us, but God. Which leads to our next section in 48 through 50. And it says, For he took notice of his lowly servant girl, and from now on all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one is holy, and he has done great things for me. He shows mercy from generation to generation to all who fear him. A faithful heart is confidently humble. That's what Mary shows us. Because she knows where she stands. She knows where she stands in relation to God and where she stands in relation to her own culture. For he took notice of his lowly servant girl. She's recognizing two things. That compared to God, she is just his servant. But even in her world that she lived in, she was kind of nobody. Just another person. Just another girl. A young teenage girl. She was not somebody special. She was seemingly no one. But she knows her worth. She knows where she stands, but she knows her worth anyway. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. She's recognizing that she will be known. She's going from being a nobody to being a somebody. Everyone is going to know who I am, but she knows her worth comes only from God. Because look at this, in 48, took notice of lowly servant girl. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the mighty one is holy. She knows her worth. Her worth comes from God. God says, you, Mary, are somebody, and I'm going to invite you into my plan and she knows that she will be known for this, for God is holy. It has nothing to do with her. She recognizes it has nothing to do with her. God is holy, for God is holy, and he has done great things for me. His, he shows mercy from generation to generation for all those who fear and know and love him. We have worth, friends. Because God says, you're somebody. One of my greatest fears ever since I was really in high school has always been that I'm just going to be nobody. I have an undergrad in history, and so you read a lot about those who influenced history, made a difference, did things. And all through high school and undergrad, all I kept thinking about is, I'm never going to leave a mark. I'm never going to be somebody. The world will pass me by and I won't matter. And I really struggled with that, especially when I was younger. But God comes in and he says, no, you are somebody. Because of God, I am somebody. Because of God, each and every single one of us have worth and value. That has nothing to do with what we do. It has nothing to do with our status or achievements or the success that we see in this life. It has everything to do with who God is and what he says about you. And he says, you are somebody. And that matters. 
It means you're special. Because God says you're special. And it is due to His grace and His grace alone. And then in the rest of this song of praise, we see in 51 through 55 that a faithful heart proclaims God's faithfulness. His mighty arm has done tremendous things. He has scattered the proud and the haughty ones. He has brought down princes from their thrones and exalted the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, sent the rich away with empty hands. He has helped his servant Israel and remembered to be merciful. For he made this promise to our ancestors, to Abraham and his children forever. forever. Mary rejoices in the faithfulness of God throughout Israel's history. And she praises God for his actions toward the lowly, the oppressed, the needy, the weak, not the rich, not the powerful. She does not recognize Solomon, one of the richest kings in history, wise throughout the ancient world. She does not recognize and celebrate David, the greatest king in their history. She does not look to Israel's past conquest and glories and successes. She looks to God's mercy and love and faithfulness and generosity toward his people. She sees Israel as she is and as we are, sinners in need of mercy. And he is faithful. God is faithful to show mercy forever again and again. God is faithful when we are weak. God is faithful when we suffer, when we lack, when we feel worthless, when we are oppressed, when we don't hold the power in any given situation, when we are helpless and feel like there's no way forward. God is faithful. God is faithful when we are hopeless And there seems to be no way forward at all. God is faithful at all times, with us and beside us always. My daughter has a lot of anxiety at nighttime. And so when I put her to bed, we pray together. And part of my prayer that I always do in some variation is thank you, Jesus, that you are with Carmen so we don't need to be afraid tonight. Just as Mary was invited into God's plan, so are we. We see God's faithfulness through his children, through us. That's how we see God's faithfulness. How does Carmen see that Jesus is always going to be with her, that she doesn't need to be afraid? Through me and my wife. We do not leave her. We do not abandon her. We do not go away. And we proclaim that God is the same. That's how she sees his faithfulness, though. How does God care for the oppressed, the helpless, the hopeless, and the powerless in this world? Through us and what we do. Yes, we proclaim God's faithfulness by explicitly praising him with our lips out loud to the world. But if we stop with simply words and our lives do not reflect God's faithfulness and the love that he has for us and for this world, then we are nothing but hypocritical symbols clashing together, annoying and pushing people away from God the Father. We proclaim God's faithfulness. We proclaim and magnify him by our actions every single day. You may not think it's much when you listen to your coworker lament their dog's death. You may not think it's much when you help your cousin or friend move. You may not think it's much when you advocate for more just laws within this system that we live in. 
You may not think it's much when you allow that mom with three kids at Kroger go in front of you in the checkout line. You may not think it's much when you challenge yourself to view the world from another's perspective. You may not think it's much, but you are showing the glory of our King in these actions every single day, in your actions of kindness and generosity, in mercy and justice, and in love and sacrifice. You show the glory of our King. In those moments, every single one of them, you are exclaiming, just as Mary did, my soul magnifies the Lord. My soul magnifies the Lord. It is Mary's opening line. It's the title of the song, the main idea, and it's a beautiful statement. My soul magnifies the Lord. It is also a reminder for us in our everyday lives. And so I ask you to ask yourself, how can I magnify the Lord? Is it those acts of random kindness and generosity and sacrificial love as we just talked about? Do we gather our children together and share with them what God has done? Plainly and clearly state that God has blessed us in this way and that way so that they know. My soul magnifies the Lord. Is it your attitude when you're at home with your family? We have the holidays. So your attitude as you gather together with extended family, no matter how difficult or challenging that may be. My soul magnifies the Lord. Is it your attitude at work as you interact with those that you see on a daily basis and sometimes it's nothing more than just a random interaction. Or you're just talking about spreadsheets. But your attitude speaks something and invites something. My soul magnifies the Lord. Is it in your study, your theology, your ideology, the way that you think about the world? There are many ideologies, there's many teachings out there that make individuals or celebrities the center of all things within people's lives. A political party that defines our relationships and our actions and the way that we treat others. A single issue that becomes an entire identity for us. My soul magnifies the Lord let this statement direct your theology, your ideology, the way that you think about this world and the way that you act within it. My soul magnifies the Lord. Let nothing, let nothing take the place of Jesus on the throne of our lives. My soul magnifies the Lord. Let your soul magnify the Lord, brothers and sisters, a particular way of life in this statement, a faithful life. It is expressed in a simple, singular phrase. My soul magnifies the Lord. And as God shows us through Mary, our faithfulness, when it converges with God's faithfulness, we see amazing things happen. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for who you are. I thank you for your goodness, your mercy, your love. These very attributes determine how you interact with us. And the way that you've done that is that you have invited us in to be a part of your plan. To take ownership of what you're doing. Thank you. 
In singular moments throughout our days, as we go about our daily lives, we have opportunities to honor you, to magnify you and you alone. Give us the grace to be able to do that. Give us the courage to be able to step into it. Give us the ability to be able to look at a world around us that may even be hostile toward us and still say, I love you. Father, you are good. Let us reflect that in all that we do. In those moments that we fail, thank you that you're merciful, that you want us anyway. Oh, Lord, we love you. We love you more than anything. Let our souls magnify you. Amen and amen.